Yeah, good afternoon, and uh, thanks for coming to the uh, third and final tech talk on quantum computing, where we are going to explore the question whether an explanation of higher brain function requires references to quantum mechanics. And uh, essentially, what we would like to do is, in the last talks, you saw how we mapped a human type task, that is image recognition, pattern recognition, to a quantum chip and how the information flow looked like and how we could deal with issues like preserving uh, coherence among the qubits. So now we want to follow the natural idea, does this have any bearing on the functioning of the brain and revisit the uh, hypothesis that quantum effects are necessary to understand brain function. Um, before we get there, let's briefly review what sort of today's mainstream view is on how brain function comes about, and essentially via classical neural dynamics. So um, as you know, the human brain sitting in the head is composed of 10 to the 11 neurons. And I have uh, pictured one here where essentially you have a cell body around which a signal emanates, essentially an electrical signal that travels along this path here called an axon and which branches out to um, like a tree. And those axon endings make connections via what's called synapses and they touch uh, another branching structure of a neuron. Here's a so-called dendritic tree. And then when the um, electrical signal travels along, hits the uh, synapses, and the electrical signal gets converted into a chemical signal, which then in turn, if enough uh, is accumulated, can give rise to another um, electrical signal and so on. So um, basically, this, the neuron is what neurobiology views as a unit of information processing in the brain. And it was first formalized by McCulloch and Pitts in uh, 1943, which is now considered to be the start of um, artificial intelligence as a field. And they simply modeled it as um, a unit that creates a weighted sum. So all the electrical inputs from the other neurons, they are weighted by some synaptic strengths, are being um, summed up. And then the sum is compared in a threshold unit to a given threshold. And if the threshold is higher, or the uh, accumulated signal is higher than the threshold, it signals. And then the signal travels to the other neurons in the network. Um, by doing this, essentially, you treat the brain as a Turing machine. Um, and what follows from this is that the brain executes Turing computable functions. I think this audience doesn't need an explanation of what this means. Essentially, what follows from this is that you would conclude that today's computers, at least in principle, are sufficient to emulate brain function. And this view, uh, going forward, I will call a classical neural dynamics or strong AI hypothesis interchangeably. So now to see how far we get uh, with such an explanation, Let's look at um, what the field of artificial intelligence has been able to accomplish um, so far. And uh, it's not a systematic li um, listing. I will only look at highlights. So let's look at what we can explain, or in this approach, what can we reproduce well. So obviously, um, memory is a cinch for um, today's computers, uh, computer memory being much more faithful than that of um, humans. Also in arithmetic operations, your little uh, pocket calculator easily outperforms you when it comes to things like multiplication. Um, also, it's probably fair to say that the best chess players today are machines and uh, not humans. If you followed a little bit the uh, DARPA competitions on autonomic vehicles, um, you can see that a task of, uh, let's say, a stretch of uh, nearly 100 miles to be done by an autonomic uh, vehicle is something that's possible today, even though I would caveat that for a human, let's say, if think of a uh, prehistoric um, human uh, venturing off from the location of his village and then hunting some deer and then trying to come back, let's say, a stretch of 30 miles, just having his eyes, nose, ears, is a much harder task 
than what uh, autonomous vehicles have to do today, since they have a GPS system, highly specialized uh, sensors. So the task that's being solved there is not really on par with what uh, humans um, do. Then another area, our own area in face recognition, um, uh, a similar milestone has been reached last year when in, in tests uh, by the government it came out that when it comes to recognizing faces in photo collections and maybe of people you don't know, let's say I present you a, a photo album showing some Chinese family, then um, most of us would perform poorer than a machine in telling which uh, faces are the same, belonging to the same person. So these are all areas where we have quite some good success. Um, more moderate success sort of where is in the area of learning. Even though we have very effective architectures for machine learning today, it's probably fair to say that in important disciplines, such as learning from few examples, or reinforcement learning, or weekly supervised learning, machines are by far not as effective as humans are. And then there are the areas where today's picture doesn't um, help us uh, come up with a good explanation at all. Um, those areas are consciousness. We do not, um, is there a problem with the um, video system? No? Okay, I will just uh, continue. So uh, things that we cannot explain as well is obviously consciousness, and I will define a little bit uh, later what I mean um, exactly by using this term. The question of uh, free will, also here I should maybe bring some of those things up. Going back to learning, strong AI would have it that in principle this can be achieved. When it comes to consciousness, strong AI would say this is an epiphenomenon. It has no functional role, hence we don't need to explain it. Um, free will in this picture simply does not uh, exist. Creativity, um, can in principle be achieved. Maybe just the software and hardware power is not quite there yet. Um, however, there, um, I would say, if you look where we are today, take a task like building an energy efficient vehicle, then today it's just we're light years away from handing the task of the design of such a vehicle to computers. If you would sort of have large databases with all the elements you can use in a vehicle, um, or future elements you may be able to use, it's today inconceivable that a machine would come up with a good solution. That's probably the reason why we are still here and in other companies. Um, even worse, um, reaching meta levels. Um, I, I would, let's say in the example with a car, if somebody comes up with the idea, yeah, to really make cars energy efficient, let's involve satellites who know the position of all cars in a, in a city and then um, uh, drive them such that we avoid acceleration phases. This will save a lot of uh, gasoline. Um, that I would call jumping to a meta level. Now, if one tries to formalize this mathematically, one might uh, say uh, this is just a form of creativity, maybe just with a vastly expanded um, space of solution. And then, again, um, strong AI would have that in principle we can do this. Um, same with natural language processing. And then a final element I want to mention because historically it is important. Are there any things that humans can do that a Turing machine cannot do? Uh, personally, I haven't seen anything a convincing example of this, but other researchers such as Penrose is of a different opinion there. Um, so now you see where the explanatory gaps are, and whenever you have a shortfall in explanation, it's maybe time to review um, your theory. And the traditional entry door for quantum ideas into a brain theory is to attempt to explain consciousness, mostly there, but also free will. Um, John Searle was here at Google um, a couple of weeks ago and uh, gave a talk on his ideas uh, how quantum mechanics and free will might be um, connected. But, and it was also my goal to make a contribution to the age-old problem what consciousness might be, but uh, then soon learned that it might be better and more prudent um, to go for a more modest goal. I tried to argue that learning 
in creativity reaching meta levels, that these are those human abilities essentially need or can take advantage of quantum processes. And explaining this might be sort of a stretch on the way to explain consciousness. So um, quickly looking at these types of problems, as you um, probably know, problem solving, as it is called traditionally in artificial intelligence, often it's an NP-complete uh, problem. And it is of the um, form where you have an objective function over some domain D, mapping into the real numbers. And then solving this problem means or amounts to finding the global minimum of this function. And uh, we have looked in the last talks how a quantum computer is extremely helpful solving this task. We also uh, looked specifically at image matching as another hard and p-complete uh, computational problem. And we. Um, saw how this could be uh, mapped onto an energy uh, minimization uh, problem. Something that came short a little bit last time is that learning, I mean, here in our context, looking at a training of a neural network is actually a NP-complete task as well. Uh, for those who are not entirely familiar with this, essentially um, a neural network is essentially a collection of McCulloch and Pitt, um, Pitts neurons um, similar to those, or exactly like those introduced on the first slide. And you have some input neurons, uh, some hidden neurons, and an output neuron. And those are connected by uh, synaptic strengths. And essentially what such um, network could do, for example, is to define a separating function between two classes in some feature space. Let's say here's this uh, blue uh, guys and the red guys. And by choosing different um, weights, you essentially get different uh, discriminating functions. And learning in this context means you choose your weight such that you minimize the errors when classifying these two uh, groups. And again, a training problem can be um, formulated as an optimization problem where you have uh, essentially a function that measures um, the overall error, and you try to tune your weight such that you minimize the overall error. Again, an optimization problem. Just to um, avoid maybe a misconception, some people might think, oh, neural networks this is so old school. I don't use this anymore. I use a support vector machine or I use uh, boosting architectures. Um, let me just remind you that SVMs and boosting essentially are simply, you can look at them as simplified version of a more general neural network structure where you just have fixed the weights in the first layer from input to the hidden units and you only apply your theory and learning algorithm to uh, the second layer. Then the algorithm um, associated with support vector machine and boosting are not NP complete anymore. Um, but what you find is there is a loss of representational power. You cannot solve all the problems anymore that the full architecture could do. So you're not really escaping NP completeness. So um, hence, this may be not a very deep thought, but um, I want to propose a new theory for computational role um, of uh, quantum mechanics and brain function. And this simply states that um, human level problem solving, learning, and pattern matching, as we just have seen, require or make use of quantum annealing in the style that we discussed in the last talk. Um, or a different way of saying almost the same thing is human abilities that require the solution of a hard optimization problem rely on quantum annealing. So to uh, say the same thing pictorially, I assume, and I borrow here the term from John Eccles, um, is that somewhere in the brain is what I would like to call a quantum box. And, this, and then there is an encoding process that takes hard, distills hard problems out of learning or out of pattern matching and um, offers it to the quantum box where a quantum annealing process runs. Um, a solution is being found, again, not always the optimal, but close to optimal or hopefully as close to optimal as possible. And then some decoding process takes place to offer this problem back um, to the more classical functioning parts of the brain. So. Um, Again, here's the quantum box responsible for quantum annealing. Functional role is it solves hard optimization problems. 
So to offer a complete theory, of course, I should say something about what is the physiological substrate? How is this quantum box realized in the brain? Um, Frankly, my um, theory is not complete in the sense that I'm not in the position to offer um, what the physiological substrate could be. However, we will study that there are numerous building blocks, or what I would call building blocks, have been identified in biology that could very well serve constructing um, a system of the nature I have um, discussed. But before we get there, let's quickly do an historical review of the uh, quantum hypothesis of brain function and consciousness. And I have picked out two strands that I think are most uh, well worked out and uh, I think most interesting. So let's start with the first one, um, probably most known one. In a seminal book, uh, The Emperor's New Mind, um, Roger Penrose in 89 has um, proposed the following. He, argues that um, mathematical reasoning, what mathematicians uh, do, is essentially a non-algorithmic uh, process. And by appealing to Gödel's theorem, he argues that um, mathematicians, human mathematicians, can do more than a Turing machine. Um, furthermore, he postulates that there is a quantum process he calls objective reduction that causes the um, quantum wave function or quantum superposition to collapse. And um, here I have a little picture how the idea would be. Essentially, think of a particle like an electron and think of a um, superposition in uh, the position basis where you have, let's say, one um, state of the electron could be it's sitting over here to the left, and the other uh, wave function could be one that's here over to the right. And essentially, you have a su the real state, however, is a superposition out of these two states. Then what uh, Penrose observed is to say, essentially, these two um, states of the electron correspond to do two states that have different mass uh, distributions. And essentially, gravity and quantum mechanics, as you know, hasn't been fully married in the physical series yet. And he said, if you were to account for gravitation, then essentially gravitation added to this picture would make the situation unstable and essentially make this superposition collapse if it reaches a certain um, amount of energy separation. Or in this picture, it's actually um, painted a little bit differently. As you know, in general relativity, mass distributions determine the configuration of space-time. So each of the two electron configurations essentially correspond to a different um, uh, configuration of space-time. And then such a superposition would essentially um, cause little bubbles to occur in space-time. And in short, he argues that nature doesn't like this. And as these bubbles grow to a certain uh, scale, then those would collapse. And this is um, this process he calls OR. Uh, mathematically speaking, probably, or not probably, would amount to adding a nonlinear term the Schrodinger equation. Again, this is a new type of quantum mechanics being proposed here, not standard uh, quantum mechanics. And one would have to say that today's experiments uh, with superpositions, let's say, of large molecules, put a very tight bound on what those nonlinearities could be at best. Um, at continuing with Penrose's idea, uh, finally he suggests that the object objective reduction amounts to selecting platonic information that is embedded on a fundamental level of space-time. And then uh, teaming up with Hemeroff, an anesthesiologist, in 96, he suggested, or both of them suggested, that the site in the brain where objective reduction occurs are so-called microtubuli. Here you see a picture of those. Microtubuli essentially um, do the scaffolding, as it's often said, in cells. It's a structure that um, I think all cells in the human body um, have. And they argue that this uh, process of OR is orchestrated inside those uh, microtubuli, hence the term um, orchestrated um, objective reduction. Now in 99, very important paper um, by Max Techmark comes along, who um, studies this on a quantitative basis. As you have learned, one of the key elements you need to watch out for if you want to do quantum computing is you need to keep um, coherence uh, intact or decoherence at bay. 
And then he looked at the idea or how long would a superposition of a neuron that is either in a firing or in a non-firing state, how long would such a superposition last? And he finds that those are extremely short times. And he finds a similar um, thing for excitations in microtubuli, those that are used in Hammerhoff's and Penrose uh, theory. You have a table out of the Techmark paper uh, that shows um, the object in neurons or microtubuli, and uh, you see different models for the environment, colliding with water, colliding with ions, and then you see these extremely short decoherence times, 10 to the minus 20 to 10 to the minus 13, and he concludes from there that those processes are not plausible candidates to do any meaningful uh, quantum computation in the brain. However, um, and here's something that we bring in, having learned to, to build a, a real uh, quantum chip, is that Techmark's calculations were done in the position basis. And a notion that hasn't been brought into the discussion at all is to ask, what is the computational basis? Because we have seen that, let's say, for the D-Wave chip, you had decoherence in the energy basis. But that didn't amount automatically to decoherence in the computational basis, which was different. So what I would argue that Techmark's calculations are probably or are correct for what he looked at. But I would argue that the intrinsic or the Hamiltonian for the intra and intercellular space is way more intricate than what his calculations looked at. And the notion that you can have a decoherence in one basis and that this very Hamiltonian protects coherence in, in another basis, which might be the basis that counts, that is the computational basis, this um, study Techmark has not done at all. Therefore, I think, at, I think what happened sort of in the sociology of science at the point that most neurobiologists, when this paper came, you could hear a sigh of relief in the neurobiology community. Oh, we don't have to, to mess with this stuff because no neurobiologists, frankly, are not trained in quantum mechanics. And essentially, Techmark, as a physicist, told them what they wanted to believe um, all along, that those effects are not necessary. And since then, also, I would say efforts in this area have diminished. But again, those calculations are way too coarse to really exclude that the coherent processes cannot do computational roles in the brain. And we will see actual examples of this. Another, um, the second strand um, of in the history of quantum hypothesis um, comes about by a group of people, um, Ron Freeman and Vitiello. Uh, Freeman, uh, Walter Freeman, the grand old man of uh, uh, neurobiology, essentially, he comes from, from a different angle. He um, so measures EEG or other, or through poking electrodes into the brain, measures neural activity at different sites in the human brain, and, or, or animal brains. And uh, what he um, finds is that there are oscillations, and often coherent oscillations, synchronized oscillations in distant sites of the brain. And he is arguing that those oscillations are too well synchronized, and the um, onset of those synchronizations are way too fast to be explained with the very slowly traveling uh, neural signals. So that is the impetus for him to say there must be another mechanism at work here. And um, these ideas actually go back. Um, he teamed up with uh, Italian physicist Vitiello, who has worked out the mass and physics of this. And this uh, theory uh, goes all the way back to Froelich, who was an expert in uh, the dielectric um, properties of materials. I tried to summarize this um, theory in this picture. Essentially, in the Freeman, Vitiello, and Al world, the brain looks like this. You have the neuropeel, essentially the stuff that all the, the field of all um, neurons and auxiliary cells in the brain that essentially amounts to a collection of dipoles sitting in your brain. Um, here I've drawn them the plus minus little molecule symbols here. And essentially in the medium of those uh, dipoles, what you have are is a little bit like in solid state physics in a crystal, where you have collective excitations going through your crystal. You have 
collective excitations, often referred to as phonons, going through your um, medium of uh, dielectric um, elements. And then you have uh, neurons who are sitting in this um, medium. And I have to admit that this is a very attractive uh, model in various ways. And in uh, theoretical um, neurobiology, such models haven't been studied at all. The functional properties of essentially an, a dielectric medium with uh, anisotropic, with uh, phonon excitations traveling through it, and then more classical neurons sort of reaching into this medium. What the functional and computational properties of uh, such a system could be, I think, is a very um, important study. And I know we do um, brain modeling here at Google. I think this would be a recommendation for something to look at. Um, yeah, so this is essentially the second school of thought that I wanted to um, look in the historical review. So again, let's quickly contrast my theory, which I haven't found a better name, um, the quantum box theory. I want to contrast it, it quickly against those theories you just heard about. First, in, in my theory, uh, quantum effects are assigned a very specific computational role. That is optimization problems. That's what they solve. Then this problem solving helps with pattern matching, um, learning, or and general problem solving through a quantum annealing process. Then maybe what I should say here, I often gave the example of the image matching uh, algorithm as a pattern matching example. I don't necessarily think that this exact problem of image recognition is solved by um, the quantum box. I'm thinking when I say pattern matching, more about a general process where you try to put two disparate um, configurations together. The reason being here's, or I should say this in a second. So essentially in this picture of the quantum box, you have classical and quantum operations cooperate. Both uh, occur, it's not one or the other. And second, behavioral and annealing time scales are dis um, decoupled. So for example, I do not think that in a very reactive mode of behavior, let's say you drive a car and there's a red light coming up and you slamming on the brakes. I don't think that in this uh, loop um, any quantum effects take place. We probably in this moment act very much like a classical automaton. However, in a situation where you chew on a problem, you take it home and you're thinking about it and you sleep overnight and suddenly two days later you're not even aware anymore that you're thinking about this problem, it hits you and say, oh, I know how to do this. What I would um, argue there is that when the quantum box came in, you had essentially this encoding, decoding process going on in the background that offered sort of the hard core of this problem to um, a quantum annealing process. Then again, uh, we discussed it earlier. I think it's important to understand what the computational basis might be and what and how it might be protected by the coherence in the computational basis, how it might be protected by an appropriate Hamiltonian uh, describing the um, dynamics in cellular and intracellular space. Um, again, I haven't, these the last two points are flaws of the series. Um, of the theory I'm suggesting so far, I'm not able at this moment to point to a physiological substrate. And uh, last but not least, I'm more looking at you know, problem solving, creativity, learning, and at this point do not make a statement yet on how this relates to consciousness. Okay, so, so far the theory. Um, now let's look for some evidence that quantum effects are at all um, active in the brain. Uh, first, I want to give you a few general arguments. Um, theoretically, as you have learned in the last two uh, sections, it's well understood um, that there are numerous computational advantages that come from exploiting uh, quantum computing. So if evolution, as we think of it, is worth its salt, you would think that evolution should preserve or enhance a powerful computational pathway. In particular, since life started from uh, single cells and below, essentially structures that were much closer to the energy scales that are relevant uh, to quantum mechanics. 
And if you look for a second in a different direction, take a spatial or spatial temporarily large scale organization. Let's take a company like Toyota. It's a, it, by any, just a slightly abstract view would tell you that Toyota can well be regarded as an intelligent system. It has sensing system that so looks what's happening outside the company. It has uh, memory, it has reasoning and planning processes. So from abstract AI point of view, Toyota is an intelligent system. And if you look how decision making happens in a company like uh, Toyota, you would see that even though the decisions affect sort of on a global scale and over years large um, space and time scales, um, the decisions that the company are make have effects on those scales, they often amount to certain individuals, the CEO, a small group of engineers, and then maybe one more influential engineer among those engineers making those decisions. And then again, textbook neurobiology would have it that when the CEO or the influential engineer thinks about something or comes up with an idea or a decision, that this is mapped back to individual neurons. Uh, so far, I think not a controversial story. So what we see is acts on a spatio-temporal large scales are being folded back to very small scale and very archaic structures. And what I have a hard time believing is that sort of the Russian puppet just stops at the single neuron level. So there's a hard ceiling that information processing below does not matter. This is not when we study nature and how information flows are organized, it doesn't seem to look this way. And um, maybe to make this point, and many people have observed this, there are organisms, let's say like here, paramecium picture, that show adaptive behavior, and paramecium can avoid an obstacle, it can find food, it can find a mate. There's actually a new paper I found, uh, various, but a very recent one by Armas et al., uh, that show uh, learning abilities. So obviously this is a single cell that does not have any ner nervous system. So how is information processing, which obviously occurs in the single cell, how it's done in the single cell? Um, so this was the general arguments. Let's move to, um, more specific, I would like to call them building blocks, processes of the style we could use um, to build uh, the quantum box system. So first I would like to point out that it's well understood that our eyes, the retina, is so sensitive that it can faithfully signal the absorption of a single um, photon, a single light quant. Um, numerous papers show this. Um, another. So this would be for the decoding, very useful. Now in the quantum box, once a solution has been found, I think reading it out, um, obviously we have neurons that are sensitive enough to do that. Um, another set of work, very recent work, uh, Mausgrohe et al. shows that um, to understand enzyme function, um, quantum mechanical effects, uh, in particular quantum tunneling, is um, a key process. Uh, again, enzymes, uh, you probably know, is sort of a biocatalyst uh, which takes sort of a substrate and uh, causes um, a chemical reaction um, to happen or facilitates a chemical reaction. And I will show another nice picture on this in a second. Um, another important piece of work is uh, studying photosynthesis and how um, this process can come about and how it can be so amazingly efficient. It is now well understood that um, to uh, transport um, energy captured in photosynthesis, which happens through the uh, so-called FMO um, complex, the Fenner-Matthews-Olsen complex, um, in order to do this, large-scale coherence takes place in this molecule, which is at least comprised, I couldn't find an exact number, so I estimated myself, um, it's probably conservative. Several thousand atoms are involved um, in this, or this molecule is comprised of. And again, large-scale coherence taking place um, to facilitate uh, photosynthesis. And uh, a last piece that um, I find quite amazing is that it has now been found that, uh, and again, this is no new age type of literature. This is uh, American Journal of uh, Chemistry, a well peer-reviewed peer journal, that the antioxidant activity of green tea um, is due to a tunneling effect. And it has long been a, a question how catechol is the key ingredient in green tea, can be so effective. It's actually the same story like uh, with the enzymes. Um, 
Here it's shown to, to do the antioxidant um, effect, you essentially have to affect the reaction. And uh, there's an energy hump you have to overcome with typical chemical reaction setup. And again, you have basically two ways to go. Classically, you go over the hump. That's the only way to go. In quantum mechanics, you can also go through the hump via tunneling. And uh, the latter being uh, much more effective, and this um, seems to be the one that um, brings about antioxidant uh, qualities uh, of green tea and of other enzymes uh, as well. So these um, processes, um, and I agree if I'd say it's a little bit of arm waving, sort of pointing at these different processes, nevertheless, they show large scale coherence, they show tunneling to be instrumental in biological processes. And I would say it's not a foregone conclusion that those processes haven't been harnessed in the brain to do a quantum annealing process of the style we discussed last time. Um, last um, set is more an application of the uh, theory. I want to argue that uh, the phenomenology of uh, what's called uh, the ayahuasca experience is uh, better explained by uh, appealing or referring to quantum mechanical effects. So for those of you who don't know what ayahuasca is, ayahuasca is a tea, it's a psychoactive tea brewed out of two plants. Um, here I have a picture. Um, you have two plants, uh, one called Banisteriopsis carpi, the other one is called Psychotria viridi, viridis. And sort of mixing those together in a procedure uh, leads to this brew, as you see here on the right picture, called ayahuasca. And uh, the earliest confirmed use of ayahuasca is about 2,500 years ago in the Western Amazon. And um, so maybe I should uh, take the last question um, first. Um, what is it like uh, to drink ayahuasca? Let me quickly jump here forward. I thought I um, bring a little um, uh, movie with me, but uh, I don't have the time for doing this. So roughly ayahuasca is a tryptamine, uh, belongs to the family of tryptamine mediated experiences. So it's like in the family of LSD, uh, psilocybin uh, mushrooms, um, and ayahuasca are roughly in the same family. But there are distinct uh, differences in the experiences as well. And um, even though I would guess that a number of you have in their life made experiences in those directions, uh, for those who don't, I think a larger set might have seen the uh, movie uh, Contact. And uh, you might recall there is a scene where this capsule falls uh, through this elaborate machine. And uh, then uh, the um, pilot, Ellie, the, the lady who sits in the capsule, goes through a sequence of um, experiences uh, that uh, shatter uh, quite a bit. And I'm pretty sure that either Carl Sagan, the author of the book, or somewhere in the chain of movie makers, um, had um, experience um, in the ayahuasca range. Because many elements that are depicted in the sequence um, are very um, are elements that occur in this experience. So first of the distortion of the visual field, sort of the, the mosaicing and spiraling, and then she, suddenly it's over, and then she has these celestial views, view on uh, celestial cities, on galaxies, and sort of is stunned by the beauty and intricacy of nature. There's also this element of meeting other beings, which comes across as her father. So it has a number. This gives you a flavor of what the experience would be like. And um, going back, um, there's still an ethnobotanical mystery around how Indians in the Amazon come up with their plant mixtures. And if you just assume it's basically a trial and error process, you would say, if you keep I mean, those people live in the uh, world's richest stocked pharmacy, where you have the most diverse ecosystem on the planet. And I roughly estimated if they have about 100,000 plants available to them, it's probably a larger set, then a two component mixture would be a selection out of 10 to the 10. So if you keep this in your house pharmacy as a key medicament, then this is a hint that this is special in some ways. Um, overall, ayahuasca is a complex pharmacological mix, and um, a key element is believed to be a dimethyltryptamine. And here you see the uh, structure formula for it. So um, how is this relevant to our concerns? Um, 
in the following way, even though I said I failed or fall short of the goal to explain consciousness. Um, nevertheless, this was sort of the starting point. And if you, and also I promised you a definition of, of consciousness. So my definition of consciousness is very pedestrian. I would say consciousness is the subjective awareness of one's own state and its relation to the environment. And I have sort of here a little picture that shows how study of consciousness can come about. Strictly speaking, there's only one thing you can be sure of, that it's conscious, and that's uh, yourself. Uh, however, we are, readily, um, well, we are ready to assign consciousness to our fellow other humans as well. And basically, if you um, do such a thing, if you look in this diagram, you have an observer that uh, communicates with a conscious entity, C, that senses some phenomenon it's uh, conscious of. But what's very key is in order to assess consciousness, you need to communicate with C. And sometimes, even though that's not required, it's helpful if there's a memory stage involved that the, the conscious system can store, oh, I was aware of that. You know, during my dream, I saw that. Sometimes it definitely helps if there's a memory element involved. But the, the key point I want to make is that um, communication is with, between the observer, the experimentalist, and the conscious entity is key to assess the presence of consciousness. And that, I think, even though that seems to me very straightforward and uh, not a very deep thought, I find so many uh, papers in the literature that drastically um, disregard or don't pay attention to this situation. So you see, say, even in Penrose's book, it goes like this. Yeah, humans are surely conscious, and I can see this in dogs and cats, maybe also or a dolphin, but then uh, a paramecium, maybe not, and a tree and a rock, for sure not. So how can we know? At this point, we cannot know whether a rock is conscious or not simply because there's no effective way for us to communicate with the rock. So this makes a study of consciousness hard, is that we have a very restricted experimental basis. Essentially, um, we can only study consciousness in systems with whom we can communicate. And there are very few. Basically, it comes down uh, to other humans. In that sense, um, the method of uh, looking at tryptamine experiences is important because I don't know whether you see here my little um, prime coming up. In the situation where you are under influence of tryptamines, you essentially change C to C prime. So your conscious system goes into a different state, and maybe the phenomena you are aware of going to different uh, are different as well. So it's essentially a tool that sort of expands the experimental basis. So um, going back to justification of this method, users um, who partake ayahuasca exp report expanded consciousness and enhanced creativity. Um, then it's, of course, useful to study. If you study a phenomenon, um, it's useful to study a situation where the effect or the understudy is most pronounced. And as I had said, what I most care for is understanding how creativity can come about. And this seems to be dramatically enhanced under the influence of ayahuasca. Um, so these are the reasonings why this is an important uh, alley for study. And uh, my theory on how the ayahuasca experiences can be explained is as follows. I would argue that you can understand the ayahuasca experience much better if you assume that if you intake ayahuasca, it essentially enhances or amplifies the operation of your quantum box. Essentially, the annealing process there to solve hard problems is kicked in overdrive. Yeah. And now let's look at some general hints again, and then we study the experience in detail. So general hints would be, as I had said, um, Ayahuasca drinkers report enhanced uh, creativity. So if you look at, um, 
sort of an outside signature. Essentially, EEG measurements have been done uh, with uh, users who uh, drank ayahuasca. And what has been found is that show, they show increased gamma coherence, uh, so this essentially waves in the um, uh, 25 to 50 hertz um, frequency range. And those uh, frequencies are enhanced in the EEG of ayahuasca drinkers. Um, those um, similar gamma bursts have been found for uh, people who are involved in uh, problem solving and who report that they solve the problem with insight. So psychologists actually have their ways of discriminating that uh, this was problem solving with insight and this was uh, problem solving without insight. In situations where insight was um, a key element, you see uh, gamma bursts. So you, in general, coherent gamma oscillations are also believed to be our best correlate to conscious being present in a human. So uh, what I noticed often is, again, I'm studying creativity and learning first and foremost, but those seem to be siblings of conscious states. So therefore, I believe that if we do a good job understanding learning and problem solving capabilities better, we might go a part of the way understanding consciousness. Um, the second general hint is the following. Um, in 2003, Wang and um, Afshalom have made an experiment that is depicted here in this figure. Um, it's outside of biology. It's not a biological system. But they studied so-called quantum dots. So quantum dots, maybe a pedestrian way of thinking of it, is you take a little copper cable. They don't use copper. They use cadmium uh, selenide. Um, and if you chop it really short, like <laughs> that you have this tiny piece of a copper line, then the electrons in um, this um, tiny piece of copper cable don't have much where to go, so they oscillate wildly around um, in different, so it's like a potential vowel, similar like we studied it. And um, those have been traded as candidates to represent uh, qubits. And then what uh, Afshalom found is that if you bring in uh, conjugated molecules, like the guys that are uh, shown here, um, at room temperature, uh, they can act as a, here's actually a quote out of their papers, so conjugated molecules of this type here can act as quantum information bus between those qubits. And if you look at the structure of those um, molecules, you will um, remark the um, similarity to um, tryptamine. Um, based compounds like uh, dematerial tryptamine. So these are just general hints that uh, there might be a relation. Now, um, the last step consists of looking at the phenomenology um, of the ayahuasca experience in detail. And essentially, um, how I've done this, I've looked at um, different bodies of reports, um, mainly from the um, book of Benny Sean um, from 2002. And there's also a book by Strassmann, or there's a website, uh, arrowit.org, where you can find numerous um, journey reports. So based on about 3,000 journey reports, you look what did the users uh, report most frequently to be their experiences. And then the message would be, if someone says, oh, I saw this huge serpent, or I saw an apparition of the Virgin Mary, you're not going out to doubt that they had this experience. Um, you take books as experiences, this is what they saw. Our goal is to understand how can such experiences come about. There are, of course, um, two caveats with this. One is if the experience makes a state outside um, of the head, so to speak, of um, the user, like I saw some diamonds lying under this tree over there, then if this was your experience, of course you could then double check whether this was a correct experience or not. Or if people report, oh, I got my disease XYZ stopped, or I had health improvement uh, Y, then of course these are things that in principle you can uh, measure and check whether indeed it uh, took place. Excuse me. Um, let me get to this in a second. Um, so, so in this table, basically, we, we list on the left hand uh, the experiences, and here the, the um, color marks, essentially, they indicate what I just explained. How much evidence do we have that, or I should start here, all those um, experiences have been reported in high frequency in the reports. 
Um, Again, the two things to check is if the experience has an import on something outside of the experience, then we can check it whether it was correct or not. And second, also how well is this concept defined? So if a user says, oh, I saw this four-dimensional being coming into my body, then you may ask, how do four-dimensional beings look to you? Um, this is a concept where you cannot be sure that different users uh, saying such a statement would actually talk about the same experience. So essentially these green dots here um, and then yellow um, and red squares, they indicate how well is the concept defined and how much data do we have to support it um, in case it has an import outside of the experience. So I might not have the time to go through, through all um, elements um, here, but I will go through the first ones. So one maybe base and easily overlooked experiential fact is that the ayahuasca experience deals with grand themes. So you're thinking about things like nature or God or truth. It's like these big ticket philosophical or religious items. It's not like, oh, my copy machine this morning broke. So how can we explain this that those big ticket um, items are more or prevalent in the experience as opposed to others. In um, classical neurodynamics would have to say, okay, there are certain areas in the brain that are responsible for this and they are being activated stronger than others. Uh, it's, uh, there's no confirmation that the tryptamines when or, uh, ingested indeed are sort of distributed that unevenly in the brain. In the um, quantum box theory, it's maybe a little bit more straightforward because the quantum box is there to um, solve big ticket problems. And this quantum box is being kicked into overdrive. So as a result, you're dealing more with uh, big ticket um, problem solving. Another um, experiential fact for which Ayahuasca is famous is that um, the visions are highly information rich, very intricate, and highly aesthetic, and often not noisy. So many people in their reports um, use cinematographic uh, comparisons where you would say something like the, the pictures you see are to everyday pictures or in, in relation to dreams, they are more like scenes, elaborate scenes out of the matrix uh, compared with uh, Bugs Bunny where essentially as an information scientist you would say the minimal description lengths of the algorithm to present or to produce such um, pictures or picture sequences is much more complex in uh, ayahuasca visions than in everyday mentations or dreams or similar um, situations. Um, again, I would argue that in classical neurodynamics you would have an issue with explaining if, let's say you assume simply something like this, um, the tryptamines reduce inhibition in your brain and sort of larger portions are now, um, uh, larger assemblies of neurons are acting uh, together, representing larger percepts that makes the experiences uh, so much more uh, rich. But then you would argue that there should be much more noise involved, less meaningful, less coherent uh, pictures. Then a um, uh, third insight is that if you, people often report that they had amazing insights or understanding of certain situations. Uh, famous anecdotes like Nobel Prizes, where the Nobel Prize winner said, okay, I saw, I had the idea for this uh, concept, um, not taking ayahuasca, but uh, LSD, there's one famous example. There's, uh, um, yeah, various anecdotes from well-respected persons who um, claim that uh, those experiences had um, a strong effect on them forming their ideas and insights. So in general, what I would say is that the insights gained under the ayahuasca experience are well-formed, um, not all of them, but many, in the sense that they stand up to rational scrutiny, meaning the next day, when you think about it, you think, oh, this was really an interesting approach. I should maybe do it this way. Or oh, this was an interesting uh, thought. And these are and standing up to rational scrutiny. Um, here, I gave it only a, a yellow mark. 
um, I would like to see sort of more sort of rigorous study have your problem solving abilities really be um, increased. Um, if you buy sort of this assumption for a second, then again, the, in the um, quantum box theory, that's natural because sort of we have kicked your problem solving um, faculty into a stronger operation and that makes your insights um, or problem solving um, capability stronger. In classical neural dynamics, it's essentially a theory of these experiences would at the end of the day amount to defect theory. Basically, taking tryptamines um, would foul up your brain chemistry and you see uh, funny things, but this has no value. It's sort of just your brain doing uh, strange things. It would be um, not easy to explain how good quality information can be derived out of those experiences. And maybe a last um, uh, experience to discuss here, this pertains to a physical condition. Essentially, the people in the Amazon who um, traditionally have used ayahuasca use it as a medicament. It's sort of the household medicament to um, improve various um, physical conditions. And in many reports, um, again, from many uh, trustworthy people, they say this stopped, that stopped. Um, and um, I only very recently, I, yeah, again, I gave it a yellow mark. I'm not sure that the FDA at this point would say, okay, in a double-blind study, we have found health improvements X, Y, Z, but uh, I'm pretty sure that those uh, studies will come, and I have the Brazilian government in the 80s when they uh, were confronted with the decision to allow uh, ayahuasca ex uh, communities to exist or not, actually made studies on sort of the IQ, uh, health status, and uh, social um, status of those communities and found that they were in average slightly better than in the surrounding communities and concluded that therefore it's safe to let those people use it. Um, in the literature list I have included one very recent paper done by John Hopkins University, not on ayahuasca but on psilocybin mushrooms, where indeed it was a double blind studies with, uh, with all bells and whistles you need. And they showed that two months after the experience, uh, most people uh, reported improvements in various directions. Um, again, in the quantum box theory, health improvements would be uh, very natural to explain. This is basically like the green tea um, uh, helped with uh, antioxidant um, uh, reactions. And in a similar way, you would argue because uh, intaking um, ayahuasca is enhancing the quantum box behavior, which in part is based on tunneling effects, those tunneling effects on a cell level essentially amount to health improvements. Actually, here you see sort of a coincidence between if you do information processing on a basic physical level, then what is um, sort of finding an optimal state for a molecule might amount to a solution in the information processing picture and might amount to finding a better energetic state for a cell or some molecules which coincides with some physical condition improvement. So here um, comes the summary slide. Um, essentially, there were three elements the uh, first element is I wanted to um, put forth the quantum box uh, thesis, which says that uh, human learning, problem solving, and pattern matching abilities use quantum annealing to solve underlying optimization problems. A second um, speculative, I admit, um, uh, thesis I put forth to say that tryptamine mediated experiences can be understood by assuming that they amplify the operation of the quantum box. And maybe to um, finalize here with a philosophical statement, as we start to appreciate um, information processing on very fundamental um, physical levels, and we are ready to assign to processes happening in a stone that information processing is taking place there. If you think a stone from a system theory perspective can sense its environment in the sense that it changes its inner state in relation to the environment. There's a memory, let's say if you knock against the stone 
and you have sort of some sound waves going through it. They will be there for a while, so there's memory. Inside, if you look on an electron level, it looks sort of akin to, let's say, an Ising model, similar to what we have seen in the D-Wave chip um, going on. So essentially, you're ready to assign to, or as we go deeper into a quantum computing, we understand better how or we appreciate more that what we looked at as unorganic matter around us is actually equipped with information processing uh, properties. Okay, that was the um, last talk. Thank you.